The Butchart Gardens in Victoria, British Columbia welcome nearly a million visitors a year. The story of these gardens is the story of three generations of the family who have built it. Beginning with Jenny Butchart a hundred years ago. Like any family story, it is filled with drama. How do you stay true to the past while renewing the vision for a changing world? For the horticultural enthusiast, Butchart Gardens on British Columbia's Vancouver Island is more than a destination. It's a garden dream come true. Even non-gardeners are bewitched by this 22-hectare floral wonderland. For Robin Clark, the gardens are both workplace and childhood home. The third generation of her family to run the gardens now a national heritage site, she is acutely aware of their value to the world. People who've been to all kinds of other gardens, Kew and, and uh, DuPont's garden and lots of other gardens in England and places, and they come and they write here and they say, this is the best garden they've ever seen. And I know what those other places look like and I know they're equally as beautiful, but there's something that catches people about this garden and it it could be the story, it could be, it's, as I say, it's hard to say. A story indeed, that started over 100 years ago. It was 1902 when Robert Pym Butchart and his wife Jenny arrived at Todd Inlet near Victoria. RP was there with one thing in mind. He had the recipe for Portland cement, and Todd Inlet had everything he needed to go into business. They dug out tons of lime and clay, leaving a sprawling pit. When the quarrymen moved on, Jenny set workmen to shifting more tons of gravel and topsoil. She had a vision of a great sunken garden. David Clark has worked at Butch Art since 1967, when he married Robin. They would divorce in the early 70s, but David stayed on as a gardener and the resident expert on Butch Art's long history. Uh, Jenny uh, Butch Art started her garden not in opposition to her husband's industrial enterprise here, because she had a, a chemistry diploma and she was able to work in the laboratory of the cement company. But she also liked the idea of gardening. Uh, as she was given, it, it goes a, 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 some sweet pea seeds and a rose bush, and she planted them near her house. And uh, they seem to flourish, as do most things, if you plant things around in this area. And she kind of went on from there and decided that she would start a garden, so she got as far away from the cement company as possible diametrically away from the kilns and the chimneys to where her Japanese garden was built. The gardens, as they grew through the early 1900s, in those days it was a much more informal thing and uh, people would just come out to visit Mr. and Mrs. Butchart at their home and their estate, Benvenuto, as it was called, Italian for welcome, and indeed, that is indeed what it did. It welcomed visitors from all over the globe. In that spirit of welcome, Jenny personally served tea to everyone who came to the garden. In 1918, when almost 19,000 visitors showed up, the tea service was retired. Each year, the gardens grew more famous. Jenny and RP traveled the world and always invited people to visit their home in Victoria, Canada. With tireless enthusiasm, Jenny continued to make her gardens grow. Jenny would just keep going. She just couldn't stop, so she'd keep evolving until she got really, I guess, the four gardens 
that she was happy with. Jenny's legacy is four magnificent gardens. What was once a kitchen garden is now filled with over 100 varieties of tea rose plants and 400 grandiflora and climbing roses. There is the romantic Italian garden, built on an old tennis court in 1926, featuring symmetrical beds and a paved courtyard. The meditative Japanese garden was built in 1906. And of course, the sunken garden, still much as it was when Jenny transformed the quarry. With the passing years, as Jenny and R.P.'s health began to fade, so too did the gardens. Workers were hard to find, and the gardens became overgrown and unkempt. Jenny and R.P. offered the gardens to the province and to the city of Victoria, but neither wanted to assume the burden and cost of their upkeep. After 30 years, Jenny's precious gardens were facing an uncertain future. It seems unlikely that Jenny Butchart could have imagined that her gardens would grow into one of the most popular horticultural destinations in the world. In the late 1930s, Jenny and R.P., struggling with ill health, moved from Benvenuto to Victoria. It was time to hand the gardens off to someone else. It wasn't going to be Jenny's daughter. She didn't have the energy or skills to manage such a large project. Jenny's garden needed more than tending. It needed to grow. It needed an individual with vision. So the gardens had to be looked after by somebody and the person they chose was a grandson, uh, Ian Ross. Ian was given the gardens before he knew it, you might say, because it appeared in a newspaper before he'd actually been told that he had inherited the gardens. There's a letter to the effect, the effect that they were giving it to him and, and also a letter that he wrote back saying how thrilled he was to, to have it. But of course he didn't take it over until about six, seven years afterwards and the story goes that it was between law and taking over the gardens and I was such an irritatingly cloying child and so noisy and loud that he couldn't study. So he gave up law and came up and took over the gardens, which of course is great. Not so great was the state of the gardens. They had remained untended while Ian served overseas in the Navy. After he returned, he and a handful of workers set about with military discipline, rapidly restoring the gardens to their former glory. But this was only the first of Ian's challenges. While R.P. Butchart's concrete business had been the financial soil out of which Jenny's gardens grew, Ian's resources were rather less than rich. To survive, the gardens would have to earn their keep. This was no small task. But Ian Ross was a determined man, energetic and passionate about what would become his life's work. From the time he took over the running of the garden proper in 1948, he was a hands-on owner filled with innovative ideas about how to make the garden self-supporting. He decided that he would make it into a destination that was, would attract tourists to Vancouver Island especially and Victoria um, to see the garden and that it would, he hoped, pay its own way. In the first of a series of savvy business moves, Ian extended the garden's hours of operation and installed night lighting throughout the four gardens. At the time, it was the largest underground wiring system in North America. As an added attraction, Ian invited stars from the New York Metropolitan Opera for evening performances. He 
He produced musical stage shows, often involving the whole family. Robin danced and sang, while her brother Christopher directed the shows. The spectacles weren't confined to the stage. This fountain, built by Ian and the staff plumber to mark the garden's 50th anniversary, continues to enchant well after its 100s. Ian's strategies worked, drawing visitors by the thousands. Some arrived on foot, but most came by car and bus. And like his grandmother, Ian was there to welcome them, not with a cup of tea, but with a firm wave to the nearest parking spot. The Ross children were part of this daily ritual. For Christopher and Robin, flowers were in their blood, but so was parking cars. I had parking in my blood right from the beginning because my father was, he liked to be in the front end of things. But he'd be out in the parking lot, you know, showing people where to go and they'd be trying to tip him too. And he'd be saying the same thing, no, no, the old guy who runs this wouldn't, wouldn't like it, so. Um, but he was an inspiration to everyone. Uh, he was a very free spirit. He loved the gardens and he enjoyed them. And he almost insisted that you enjoyed working here too. In fact, he, 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 he certainly did insist on it. He made it fun. He just, he had a facility for knowing when you were in trouble or when you were having something that was really annoying you and he'd come over and he'd just fix it. He was just great. Admired by the public, lauded by politicians and loved by his staff, Ian Ross did more than sustain his grandmother's gardens. He created his own legacy. After running the gardens for nearly 50 years, Ian Ross passed away. With his death came the unavoidable question. Who would be the visionary? The one who could ensure that the gardens and the legacy would carry on. As the daughter of Ian Ross, Robin Clark literally grew up at the Butchart. But she knew all along that the gardens would go to her brother Christopher. He was always the one, even though my parents never talked about who was going to get the gardens, we all knew because it was a very progenitor family and so it would go to the oldest son, and it did. Unable to see a future for herself at the gardens and against her parents' wishes, Robin set out to find a life of her own. My parents had already always said, don't work for other people, you know, because you're taking up somebody else's job. But she found work at a local hospital. And so consequently, I was the local vampire, so I got taking blood samples. And um, I worked there for 11 years, and I absolutely loved it. Happy in her career, Robin also found love with her longtime partner, Norm Dyson. Together, they built a rich life, far from the gates of Butchart Gardens. In 1997, at the time of Ian's death, things at the gardens were in a state of change as Christopher took over the running of the operations. Although his father had left big boots to fill, Christopher had already made his own mark on the gardens with the creation of a spectacular fireworks display. The fireworks have become almost as famous as the gardens themselves. Christopher combined a love of theatricality and floral beauty with a near obsessive attention to detail. Here was the visionary they were waiting for, the genius who would continue to ensure the garden's health and future. But not long after he assumed control, Christopher suddenly fell ill. And so he was here for a year, and then he started feeling, you know, he couldn't get a lot of breath. And then they finally found out what it was, and it turned out to be fatal. And so he, they gave him six weeks. And then he made us have family photos, which we'd never had family photos. If you look at them, you would never know they were taken a week before he died. And he was, he was dead in six weeks. But you wouldn't have known that he was sick at all, aside from the fact that he was on an oxygen tank, because he just steamed forward with his life. 
He never stopped. He loved eating. He loved cooking. He loved having people around him. And we did that the whole six weeks up until the day he died. With Christopher's death, Robin was suddenly thrust back into the life she'd left behind, her life at Butchart Gardens. In an undeniably bittersweet moment, she returned to take over the management of the gardens. People ask me, how did you come to have it? I just say, from a fortune of birth and a misfortune of death, I'm in the place where I am. And after sort of 50 years, there's a change, even with Christopher. It makes people nervous. They don't know what you're going to do. Luckily, uh, my partner, Norm Dyson, came with me. And uh, so he came out, and with me, we've run the place since. Aside from me losing Christopher, because now that makes me an only child, the gardens, I think, lost somebody who would have probably made them even more beautiful than they are because he had such an eye for that. So he's very close in my heart, and I try to stay true to what he would have wanted here and what my father would have wanted here. When Robin returned to run the Butchart Gardens, she knew it was not a task for the faint-hearted. With seven different departments and hundreds of employees, Robin has had to keep the gardens running efficiently. Even when filled with thousands of people, the gardens don't feel crowded. Much thought and planning is given to its day-to-day -day operation, down to the minutest details, making all who visit here feel welcome. You can see how many different languages we've had to translate our guide into. There must be 30 different languages. It's, it's just accommodating people in that way. Uh, they tend to come back. Now we're seeing a lot of people coming from India, so we're translating it into Punjabi and all the different languages from there. And so it, it's really kind of more complex than most people would, would realize on looking at it from the surface. The analogy we like to use is it's like a duck cruising across a pond. It looks sedate and placid on the surface, but they're pedaling like mad underneath. It's a real uh, good thing, good feeling to be, to know you're associated with something that has that background and to try to carry it on. For Robin, support has come from her partner, Norm. But she has also found much inspiration by looking to the past. I was fortunate to work with my father for such a long time and to have, see how he ran things and how he wanted the place to be. I'm not a fatalist, but there had to be some reason. There had, maybe not for my father dying, but definitely for Christopher dying, because he was only about 56, and there was no reason why he should die. But for two deaths, I turned up being here. And, uh, and I just think it was somehow fated that I was supposed to have it. So I was really thrilled to come here and to be here and to be part of it and to be the steward of it as long as I can until it's time for my son to take over. Well, we're flying. Um, David and Robin Clark's son, Barnabas, has watched his mother assume the role of steward of the garden. He will be the fourth generation of his family to grow Jenny's garden. The things that's gonna be more, most important are the things that she's teaching me now. She's been very committed to inviting me to be a part of this. And uh, I think that's a, the right way of putting it, too. Because it's, uh, you know, I don't really have 
it's not a right. You know, I don't feel that I, it's, it's my, it's my lot to work here by any means. I mean, in, inherently it is, but I don't feel that I, you know, I've earned anything yet. But she's certainly made me feel, you know, a responsible part of the cog that's the wheel of the gardens. And uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying being more involved. For Robin, every flower in the Butch Art Gardens holds a memory of her great-grandmother, Jenny, and her father, Ian. Ensuring the future of the gardens means that their legacies will live on. With the fireworks that end her garden's day, Robin acknowledges that legacy and the great family story that has created it. Like that story, and like the family, this is a moment filled with great sadness and great joy.